Good morning. You can stop talking now. That's what we in the Church of Christ call a call to worship. So, hey, good morning. Uh, welcome. Glad you're here. We are going to begin this week a little bit differently. Actually, we began this way last week, and it would be fine with me if we did this every Sunday. We're going to start with a baptism this morning. We've got all our kids in here. Hey, why don't you guys stand up for me real quick? Just stand up, and I want you to turn around and wave at all the nice people. See? There we go. Now wave at everybody else. So, there we go. Okay, now you guys can sit down again. Thank you. Glad to have you all up here this morning. This morning, uh, two young ladies, they're sisters uh, in, genetically, but they're about to be sisters spiritually as well. Abigail and Anna Claire Shelton are going to be baptized by one of our ministers, Steve Krieger. Their, their parents, Scott and Corey Shelton, are back there with them right now, and I think we are ready. This is Anna Claire, and this is Abigail, and they said they've been thinking about this for about a year, really intently for about the last month that they are ready to be baptized uh, and give their life to Christ. And mom and dad are standing right up here filming it. Uh, and they've got several family members here, so this is a very special day. Um, so Anna Claire, let me ask you, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? Yes, sir. Abigail, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yes, sir. All right, well, we're going to baptize you two ladies based on that confession. Got it? Because of your confession, I'm able to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit for the mission of your sins. Ready? Because of your confession, I'm glad to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the remission of sins. Boom. Let's stand. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. At the name of Jesus, every tongue confess. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every knee shall bow at his name. He is the wonderful counselor. He is the mighty God. He is the everlasting Father. He is the Prince of Peace. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. At the name of Jesus, every tongue confess. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every knee shall bow at his name. There is no other Every knee shall bow At the name of Jesus Every tongue confess At the name of Jesus Every knee shall bow Every knee shall bow At his name Every knee shall bow At his name Every knee shall bow At the name of Jesus Every knee shall bow Hey again, just want to welcome you. If you're a guest this morning, thanks for coming to be with us today. If you are passing through on your way to somewhere else, we'll wish you Godspeed and safe travels. If you are from Huntsville and you're looking for a church home, love to talk with you about uh, becoming a member at Twickenham, hearing what God's doing in your life, sharing a little bit of our journey with you and see if our journeys could join God's and what he is doing. Just really, really glad that you're here. There is a card on the seat in front of you. You can take one of those, fill that out. You can indicate any changes to your, if you're a member, indicate any changes to your contact information so that we can update that in our files uh, so that we can communicate with you when we have important information to share. If you're a guest and you'd like to hear more about our church, indicate that on the card. And if you have any prayer requests, we'll be happy to take those and we'll be praying about those as early as tomorrow morning. Just really glad you're here. Thanks for coming out to be with us. We are in a series right now called uh, Right on the Money. Um, 
me, my stuff, and God. I thought the other screen was going to say the other thing, but there it is. Me, my stuff, and God. And what we're trying to do is learn how our, our possessions and our money affect our relationship with God and our relationships with each other. And one of the things we've learned is that the Bible just has a lot to say about our possessions and about our money. In fact, Jesus said more about money and possessions than he did sexual immorality, and the church has talked about the one more than the other for a long time, and so you kind of wonder. So we're really trying to wrestle with this and understand what he's saying to us through, uh, through, through Scripture about our money and possessions. Uh, you should know, and I want to reassure you, this is not a series about giving. This is, today is not a sermon on giving. We're not, that's not where we're going with it. Generosity comes up because it's a part of that conversation, but it's, a, it's about a whole, lot, a whole lot more than that. And so this morning, uh, obviously, we're going to do things a little bit differently. Um, I'm just going to tell you a story. And it's a story about an economist. In fact, some say he was the world's first economist, which sounds absolutely boring, right? But it's also a story that involves a desperate housewife, and that sounds kind of interesting. And the story also includes a world leader who is absolutely confused, and that sounds pretty relevant, right? So we're, we'll kind of see how all of that goes. Before we get into the story, though, and you can kind of follow along in your order of worship to see what's coming next. Before we get into that, I want to say a word about how we hear Bible stories, how we read them, because I think we make a mistake when we read these Bible stories. I think we, we assume that the story is about the human character in, in the passage, in the story, it, that, that, it's, that, that the human is the protagonist, and we get caught up in the conflict and the tension and the resolution of all of that. And, and then we go, okay, then if I will just do what this character did, I will, I will in, in experience those kinds of results. Or if I will avoid the mistakes this character made, then I will, I, I will avoid those kinds of consequences. And we just assume it's about the character, the human character. Um, and then we lionize those people. We make them out to be better than they were. We make them out to be paragons of perfection. And we minimize their flaws, and we maximize their virtues, and what we forget and what we don't realize is they're just a lot like us. They were a mixed bag. There was virtue and there was vice. There was wisdom and there was idiocy. There was heroic faith and there was cowardly uh, unfaith. The Bible is really honest about the characters, the human characters. It, it tells us the truth about them, and they were all flawed, even the best of them. Even the best human characters needed massive doses of God's mercy and God's grace just to draw breath in his presence. And while these human characters were a part of the story, they were not the story. God is the story. It's all about God. And, and if we just look at the human piece of it, then, then we stop too soon. We may get some pretty good life lessons. We might see some wisdom there. But if we don't realize what the story is really about, then we wind up missing what it wants to tell us about God. It's his story. We're a part of it. He invites us to be a part of it. He welcomes us into his story. But it is, above all, his story. So what we're going to do just to begin with is try to center in on that idea, just that it's about God and that God's ways are mysterious and we don't always understand what's going on, but it's his story. He is bringing it to his end for his purposes, for his glory, and we're a part of it. We don't always understand it, but it's all about him. Paul actually addresses this in Romans chapter 11. I'm going to read something to you from the message translation done by Eugene Peterson, and I think he really captures this idea of the mystery of God as he moves and does and creates and orders and rules our lives. Listen to this from uh, Romans chapter 11. Have you ever come on anything quite like this extravagant generosity of God, this deep, deep wisdom it's way over our heads. We'll, we'll never figure it out. Is there anyone around who can explain God? Anyone smart enough to tell him what to do? Those are rhetorical questions. No. 
Anyone who has done such a huge favor for God that he has to ask them for advice. And then Paul really drills down on this idea that it's all about God and that it's all heading toward God. Mysterious though it may be, it's all about him. Everything comes from him. Everything happens through him. Everything ends up in him. Always glory, always praise. Yes, yes. Yes, let's sing. God moves in a mysterious way, His wonders to perform. He plants His footsteps in the sea and rides upon the sword. Ye fearful things, fresh courage ye so much dread, are bid with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every
relationships with one another. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature God, didn't consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We place you on the highest place for you are the great high priest we place you high above all else all else and we come Your feet. We place you on the highest place. For you are the great high priest. We place you. come to raise you to the highest place. As Jesus, your son, was raised on the cross, the highest place of all, reigning there and in heaven and on earth, the highest place, but only accomplishing that by making himself the lowest, becoming a servant by giving himself in death for all of us. And we give our utmost thanks and disbelief that you could love us that much as we share this bread together this morning and all that agree say in Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Think about his love. <clears throat> Think about his goodness. Think about his grace that's brought us through. For as high as the heavens above, so great is the measure of our Father's love. Great is the measure of our Father's love. How could I forget His love? How could I forget His mercy? He satisfies, He satisfies, He satisfies my desires. Think about His love, think about His goodness, think about His grace that's brought us through. For as high as the heavens above, so great is the measure of our Father's love. Great is the measure of our Father's love. Let's pray again. Holy Father, we, we love you. Father, we recognize you as our creator. We recognize you as our redeemer. And Father, we are thankful for your love. We're thankful for your goodness. And we're thankful for your grace. Father, we know that we sin often. And Father, we often forget. Father, we ask your forgiveness for that. Father, as we continue in this, this supper together, as we partake of this, this cup, Father, help us to fully remember the sacrifice that was made for us. Father, the love that we cannot even understand, but Father, we are thankful that your ways are above our ways and your understanding is above our understanding. But help us each and every day to strive to be more and more like your son. Thank you for his sacrifice. In his name I pray, amen.
Think about his love. Think about his goodness. Think about his grace that's brought us through. For as high as the heavens above, so great is the measure of our Father's love. Great is the measure.
so there was this guy named Jacob. Remember the part where I told you earlier that the characters in the Bible, we, we tend to sort of lionize and make them out better than they were? Jacob's one of those guys. Um, he was not a very good son. He was a terrible brother. In fact, his brother at one point wanted to kill him. And as you'll see, he was not a great father either. He was, this, he was the grandson of a man named Abraham, who's like one of the top three people in the Bible. And um, Jacob was the father himself of 12 sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, that, that group, whom God used to create the, the, the nation of Israel. Like we, we know those 12 sons of Jacob as the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. So actually there's some encouragement here already because as soon we, we hear that Joseph was not a good guy and yet God uses him to create this nation out of which comes Jesus Christ. So even if you're a scoundrel, there's a place for you in God's story, which is really, really encouraging to me and should be to some of you because, okay? So Jacob has these 12 sons, and in his old age, he has a 13th son, and he named him Ad, which makes kind of sense because you add a child in your late life. It's an addition to the family. We know him as Joseph. And I guess Jacob loved all of his kids, but he really loved Joseph. I mean, he really, really, like, he blatantly favored Joseph. My mother, and she's listening online right now, so hi, Mom. Um, my mother, every Christmas, a joke in our family, every Christmas my mother will say, now we spent the same amount on all our children we don't make a difference in any of our love for our children, which is a sweet thing for my mother to say to my siblings because she and I both know the truth. But <laughs> so Jacob made no bones about it. I mean, he didn't hide it. He blatantly favored Joseph. Uh, so much so that at one point he even made a special coat. It was a coat of variegated colors. It was a very elaborate coat. Maybe you've heard the, or seen the theatrical production, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, right? That's what it was. It was this fabulous coat that, that, that Jacob made for Joseph, and it was his way of sort of placing the mantle on this favored son and saying, you're you're going to carry the name. You're my favorite. I like you better than everybody. I love you better than everybody else. And Joseph wore it everywhere he went, uh, which irked his brothers to no end. And, and I think maybe all of this positive affirmation that he always got, this uncritical praise that he always got, kind of went to Joseph's head because at one point he started dreaming about how awesome he was. Uh, now, we know that the Bible doesn't specifically say this, but we know the dreams were from God because they're prophetic in nature. They, they, pro they prophesy about Joseph's future. And, and what, what, they, what they tell us and what they told Joseph was that at one point, you're going to kind of be the center of the universe. Everybody's going to bow down to you. I know you can't help what you dream. I dreamed last night that somebody put wagon wheels on my truck, and it looked really weird. You can't, and I don't know what that means, and I don't want you to try to tell me what it means because I don't care, all right? I know that you can't help what you dream, but you don't have to talk about it, right? If, you're, if you dream that the sun, moon, and stars bow down to you, don't feature that. Don't lead with that. But Joseph did. He told his brothers how they were all going to bow down to him one day. And even his dad, even Jacob, who favored him, said, son, just don't. That's not, don't do that. But he did. When the brothers had had it up to here with Jacob's favoritism and Joseph's arrogance, they did a bad thing. They were out tending their sheep one day, way, way away from home, and Jacob sent Joseph, the favorite, to go out and check on him, maybe to check up on him. And so they saw him coming from a long way off, and, and they go, well, here comes the dreamer. And then they started thinking about what they were going to do to him. And when he got there, they ripped the coat off of him, and they threw him in a pit, threw him in a well. 
And there was a debate. Some of them wanted to just kill him, just kill him, be done with it. Others said, no, we can't do that. Let's just leave him. Reuben, the oldest, was going to come back, get him out of the well later and take him home to his dad. But what they finally decided to do, as they're sitting around debating, a caravan comes by and they sell him to human traffickers. And then they take the coat and they rip it up and they splatter it with blood and they go home and they tell old Jacob, a wild animal must have killed your son. And here's the jacket. They provided the jacket to sell the lie. And that was just, that was just mean. I mean, I know that Joseph was arrogant and that Jacob was wrong to favor one, but that was just mean. So Joseph's been up, and then he's at literally down in a well. He's his father's favorite, and then he's at the bottom of a well, and then he goes even further down. He's sold to human traffickers who take him down to about as low as you could go back then to Egypt. And they sold, the human traffickers sold Joseph to a wealthy Egyptian government official named Potiphar. And so Joseph is a slave now in Egypt. But this is one of the few places in the story where God peeks through and shows himself. God gave Joseph success. In, in, as a slave, God gave Joseph success. And so Joseph kind of rises to power in, in Potiphar's house. And Potiphar's household prophets soar. And Potiphar's really happy with Joseph right now because this is going really well. And Potiphar's wife, Mrs. Potiphar, the desperate housewife, notices Joseph. And he apparently was a handsome young man because she starts making advances toward him. And he spurns every one of them. He, he's, every time he says no. And then at one point when Potiphar's out of town or out of the house, she grabs Joseph by the coat and says a wrong thing. And he flees. He runs, leaves the coat behind, runs out of the house, and then she accuses him of attacking her, and that's just mean. Well, Potiphar comes home, she's crying, she accuses Joseph, and Potiphar is furious. I, this is not in the story, but I've always wondered if that had happened before. I mean, I wonder what happened to the previous household, the head household slave, the one that Joseph replaced. What happened to him? And I wonder if Potiphar even knew that. But at this point, his hands are tied, so he's got to do something. He throws Joseph in prison. So Joseph has been up, father's favoritism, down in a pit, even further down as a slave, then he begins to rise up until he is accused. And there's always an, an until. You know, things are going great until X happens, X happens, he's in prison. But then again in prison, he kind of begins to rise. He, he takes on more responsibility. He becomes kind of a trustee in prison. And while he's in prison, he meets two fellow cellmates who used to be employees of the Pharaoh himself, the butler and the baker. They're not named, but they're called the butler and the baker, and they have dreams one night. So the next day, they're kind of in the exercise yard talking about their dreams, and they're wondering what they mean, and Joseph says, well, God gives interpretations to dreams, so tell me your dreams, and they do. And Joseph interprets them by the power of God, and it's good news for the butler and bad news for the baker. Three days later, Pharaoh has a birthday party, and the butler is restored to his former position as a gift to Pharaoh. And then as another gift to Pharaoh, they hang the baker. But before the butler leaves prison, Joseph says, now you remember me. You re when, you, when you get back to your position with Pharaoh, you remember me and get me out of this jail because I am innocent. And the butler forgets, which is not mean, but it's unfortunate because Joseph languishes in prison for another two years. And then Pharaoh, one night, has dreams, weird dreams, crazy wagon wheels on your truck dreams, really strange dreams. He dreams that he's standing by the Nile River and seven fat cows come up out of the river. Fat, sleek, healthy, exactly the kind that a farmer would love to see. And then seven lean, skinny, sickly cows come up out of the Nile and the sick cows eat the healthy cows, but the sick cows don't look any better for it. And then Pharaoh wakes up and he goes, wow, that was weird. 
but he manages to go back to sleep. Then he has another dream. In this dream, there's a stalk of grain with seven fat heads of grain on the one stalk. It's like a chamber of commerce head of grain. It's a great head of grain. It's a beautiful head of grain. And then there's a sickly one right next to it with tiny little shriveled up heads on it and it's scorched by the wind and and the shriveled up stalk eats the healthy stalk. And then Pharaoh wakes up and he's really freaked out now because carnivorous cows, alien plants, what's going on here? And it doesn't help that those are symbols of his religion. Hathor was always depicted as this fat, white, sleek cow. And she was supposed to be the mother of the sun god Ra. And then Neper was the grain god. And so Pharaoh's really freaking out. And he calls all his wise men together. And he says, I've had this dream. Here it is. Tell me what it means. And they go, we got nothing. We don't know. We have no clue. And then the butler goes, you know what? I know a guy. And so they go get Joseph out of prison. They clean him up because he's been there for years. And they bring him into Pharaoh. And Pharaoh says, I understand that you can interpret dreams. And Joseph goes, not really. And everybody's really nervous, and the butler especially. And then Joseph says, but God can. God can interpret dreams. And so Pharaoh tells him the dream. And I want to read you what Joseph says. It's in Genesis chapter 41, okay? Genesis chapter 41, and we'll begin uh, around verse 28. And so this is Joseph talking to Pharaoh. It is just as I said to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt. But seven years of famine will follow. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms, cows, grain, is that the matter has been firmly decided by God and God will do it soon. So now the economist in Joseph comes out. And now, let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the, in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by the famine. And I wonder who Joseph has in mind. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man? one in whom is the Spirit of God? And Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. Over the next seven years, Joseph collected 20% of Egypt's gross domestic product, 20% each year. And then just as he predicted, the famine hit. And when the people began to feel the bite, they came to Joseph, and he sold the grain that he had taken from them back to the people from whom he had taken it. I don't know whether that's mean or not, but that is government. I'll let you figure out any political lessons, uh, if there are any. The thing that I want you to see is that even when Joseph could not see him, even when it felt like God was nowhere to be found, God was there in the ups and in the downs and everything in between, taking care of Joseph and ultimately taking care of the entire nation of Israel. At the end of the story, you get to Genesis chapter 50, Joseph looks back on everything that has happened, and here's what he says to his brothers. He says, you intended 
to harm me, but God intended it for good. And you see what is being done here today. In other words, God wasn't just in this story. This was God's story. This was about God from start to finish. There's a great passage in Psalm 103. I think David must have had this story in mind when he wrote these words. He said, praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit. Joseph was thrown into a pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. I'll come back in a few minutes and give you some takeaways on this one, but right now, let's just think about, sing about, and praise God for being there with us every step. Let's stand. Praise you, heavens, and all that's above. Praise Him, you angels and heavenly hosts. Let the whole earth praise Him. Praise Him, the sun, moon, and bright shining stars. Praise Him, you heavens and waters and skies. Let the whole earth praise Him. Praise
Who on earth could comfort me and love me like you do? Who could ever be more faithful, true? I will trust in you. I will trust in you, my God. Come on, there's a fountain. There is a fountain. Who is a king? Victorious warrior and Lord of everything. My rock, my shelter, my very own. Blessed Redeemer who reigns upon the throne. My rock, my shelter, my very own. Blessed Redeemer who reigns upon the throne. Amen. Be seated. So even, this, even though this story is about God, there are some lessons that you and I can learn from it. And I just want to give you two. Uh, the first one is kind of practical and sort of an economic principle. In some ways, the, the Joseph story is a, is a parable of a passage we looked at a couple of weeks ago from Proverbs chapter 21, verse 20. In the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil, but a foolish person devours all they have. You kind of see how that story unpacks the principle in that, in that proverb there. We talked about, a few weeks ago, we talked about there are three things you can do with your money. You can spend more than you make, you can spend all that you make, or you can spend less than you make. And the Joseph story is one that just counsels spend less than you make and save, because you, you, you don't ever know what the next seven years are going to bring. It, it may bring even more abundance than you've experienced to this point, or it could be it could be terrible. So spending less than you make is, is just wise. It, I think it's cool that here's this really old ancient Bible story and there's this really great wisdom in it. You, even if you don't believe that the Bible is God's word, inspired, infallible, and errant, even if you don't believe that, here's a principle that if you live by that principle, your life is going to be better. You're going to live a better life just by following that principle. And I would, what I would say is that there are hundreds of lessons like that in Scripture. So attend to it. it it's, a, it's a great resource for you. Now, so here's the second takeaway, and this one's a theological principle. It's a, it's a promise, really. There's an old economics joke that says that if all the economists in the world were laid end to end, it'd be a good thing, okay? Because they never, they never reach conclusions, or at least they disagree on the conclusions. They're, they're always debating and disagreeing with one another. Here's one thing, though, that all the economists agree on, the business cycle. Economies expand, then contract. They rise, then they fall. They boom, and then they bust. They all agree that, that that's just a, a, a fact of, uh, of economies. What they, what they can't get together on is why. Why, why economies do that? Some economists think that the fluctuations of, of markets happen. Um, it, it's a mystery. They, 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 there's no, nobody can explain why. Nobody knows why they happen. It's just a feature of market economies, and you have to write them out as best you can. Just a mystery. Some economists think that uh, the boom and bust, the business cycle, is because government gets involved when it shouldn't. And they'll point to things like the credit and the housing crisis of, a, of the previous decade, how if the government had not lowered interest rates so low and, and lowered the qualifications to get loans, then people who shouldn't get loans got them, and then they bundled, people bundled all that and sold it to investors, and then people started uh, not paying their mortgages, and the whole thing kind of fell in on itself, and it's all because the government got involved. That's what some economists would say. That's those, those are the conservative economists. And then there are people who say that, that economies go through this expansion and contraction, this rise and the fall, this boom and the bust, because of technological innovations. That, that somebody will, 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 will introduce a new way of doing business or a new technology, and it totally disrupts everything. And then companies that can't keep up 
lay, their, lay off workers or they close all together and there's less money flowing through the system and everything kind of slows down and that kind of makes sense too. I mean, when was the last time you walked into a Blockbuster video store? Or a Sears or a Kmart? Thank you, Netflix, Amazon, and Walmart, right? And then some economists, the Marxist economists say that, well, it, it's just an inerrant evil of exploitative capitalism. Why, if you just look at Venezuela and see how well the other system is working, oh wait, it's not, right? So there are lots of different reasons out there for why these things work, but the truth is they're just a fact of life. From 1945 to 2013, there were 11, the U.S. experienced 11 booms and busts, 11 uh, expansions and contractions. And what's really interesting is that these fluctuations in fortune are not just about economies. It's not just a feature of the economy. It's a fact of life. Rising and falling, expanding and contracting, boom and bust, success and failure. It's not just about money. It's about life. Remember that passage we heard right before communion this morning from Philippians chapter 2? Jesus was with his father in heaven, or chapter four, he was with his father in heaven, and then he took on the form of a servant, and then God raised him to the highest place. Jesus was up, Jesus was down, Jesus was up. Fact of life. Joseph story. Joseph was up, Joseph was down. Some of us, I think right now, feel like we are in a multi-year season of struggle. Life has been one protracted bust for some of us, a famine, a prolonged contraction. And it's not just about our finances. Some of us are in a famine of health. We got some really bad news from a doctor. Or we lost somebody we loved. Some of us are struggling in our relationships. Our marriages feel like they're unraveling. The red lights are burning on the family dashboard. We're in a prolonged season of estrangement. And in those times, in these times, you wonder, where's God? The, the interesting thing about Joseph's life is that it was, it was a lot like ours. It was up and it was down. Up and it's down as, as the markets. It begins up, enjoying his father's favoritism, and then he's down in a pit, and then he's down in Egypt, then he's up at Potiphar's house, and then he's down in prison, then he's up a little bit in prison, then he's disappointed because he's forgotten, and then he's back up again. His whole life is like that. So here's, here's the promise. Here's the, here's the lesson we learn about God in that story. And that is that no matter where you are, whether things are going awesome for you right now, and for some of us they are, or whether things are as bad as they could be, and right now for some of us they are, or you're somewhere in between, God is in that. God is there. God is working out his purposes. God is accomplishing his will. God will finish this story in victory, and you and I will be a part of that. If anybody knew, knows struggle, if anybody in the, in the whole world knows what struggle and hardship and trouble are like, it's Russians. Especially Russians who lived in the turbulent 19th century like Fyodor Dostoevsky. He spent four years in a Siberian prison camp, shackled hands and feet the whole time. And he wrote a book about it. It's called uh, The House of the Dead, which kind of tells you everything you need to know about that experience, right? But I want you to listen to what he says about, about the hope that he has. He, despite all of the adversities that he experienced, he still believed that God was with him and that God would bring everything to a, to a beautiful and just end. Here's what he wrote. I believe like a child that suffering will be healed and made up for, that all the humiliating absurdity of human contradictions will vanish like a pitiful mirage, that in the world's finale, at the moment of eternal harmony, something so precious will come to pass that it will suffice for all hearts, for the comforting of all resentments, for the atonement of all the crimes of humanity, for all the blood that they've shed, that it will make it not only possible to forgive, 
but to justify all that has happened. God is in this, and we will be okay. We're going to sing one more song, then Bob Noblet's going to lead us in a prayer, then I'll have some family news for you. Hide me now under thank you that we can call you our Father. We acknowledge your majesty and your power and thank you for your love. Thank you for this time that we have had to worship you. May we always be mindful of your love for us and that you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins. Thank you for the two precious souls that we were that were baptized today. Lord, we thank you for our brother Jody and his ability to present your word. Thank you for the many ways that you have blessed us. We ask that you go with us throughout the days of our lives and that you heal those with health issues, comfort those who are hurting, provide strength for our weakness and safety for those who are traveling. Thank you for Jesus, in whose name we offer this prayer. Amen. Hey, I want to share some family news with you here um, real quick. Uh, next Sunday, there's a baby shower for Jeff and uh, Brittany Taylor. That's going to be from 1.30 to 3 at the Mercy Building. They are expecting a boy, and they are regist- registered at Babies R Us and Target. This Wednesday night, we begin... Uh, A five-week series on Wednesday nights called Midweek Spring. We'll be having our our regular spring instrumental service combined with some teaching that that, uh, we're going to be doing. I'll be doing a series called What Would Jesus Ask? And we're going to look at five questions. Jesus asked hundreds, about a hundred questions, 
in the New Testament. We're going to look at five questions. And the question this week is from Matthew chapter 15. How many loaves do you have? That's the one we'll be looking at this week. So I hope you'll join us uh, Wednesday nights uh, at 6.30. We'll start having dessert around 6.15. And I think the first night we're going to have Steel City Pops. Am I right about that? Steel City Pops. So those are, if you don't know what those are, you should come. They're really good. Um, third item, we are going to have an ice cream social. We'll make our own ice cream that night on August 13th, Sunday at 5 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall. That's also the night that we're going to welcome officially the Gendrons with us. We'll have ice cream, and then we'll make fun of the Gendrons, our new youth ministers. So, yay. Can't wait for that. All right. And then I want to I want to do one more thing here. Let me let me call a couple of folks here. Blake and Bailey, can you guys come on up? I want you I want you guys to come up here. I talked a little bit about this Wednesday night, but we got a bigger crowd this morning. I want you to see these two folks. Blake and Bailey have been our interns this summer, and and that's really not the right word for it because they wound up. Let me pull this back a little bit. They wound up not being interns at all, but interim youth ministers is what they really did for us this summer. When Jesse and Shelby uh, decided they were going to move to, uh, near, 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 up to Tennessee to be nearer uh, their families uh, so that their girls could be around their grandparents and they could be near family, Blake and Bailey said, we will still come and we'll come early and we will work through the summer while you guys look for uh, new youth ministers, and they, they were with us the whole time. They've worked, we have worked them really, really hard. They don't ever want to see Lincoln Smith's face again, <laughs> ever. So we have actually have a support group for people like that. It's called Twickenham Church of Christ. So anyway, I, I want you to know these two kids enhanced their resumes this summer. They did a really great job. We love them. We're proud of them. Blake is going to go back to Atlanta because he hasn't seen his mother. Well, his mother hasn't seen him in a while, and she wants to spend some time with the boy. His dad wants to take him to some ball games. And Bailey's one of ours, so she's not going anywhere. They'll be going back to school in a few weeks, but I want you to give them a hand and take every opportunity to thank them for their work. Thank you. Thank you. All right, one more thing, and I'm calling an audible on this one. I want everybody, I want all of you, you young people, just to stay seated, and I want everybody else to stand, okay? They're going back to school this week. Our kids are going back to school this week. And I want you guys to recognize that you got all these people standing behind you and are here for you. And if you ever need anything, your church is here for you. And we love you. And we will always be here for you. And I want us to have a prayer for them. And I want you, I want you and me to pray for these kids all year long. Pray for their, their uh, little brothers and sisters who are downstairs. Pray for the teachers and lift them up constantly as they head back to school this, year, this week. So let's, let's pray about that. And then we're, then we're done, okay? Holy Father, we have learned this morning that you are part of the story. That you're not just a part of the story. You are the story. And that, and that we are being carried along in this story by you and for you and through you and in you. And we're so thankful to know that you're in charge and that we're not. And so we are coming to you as the main character, the protagonist in this story. And we're asking you to protect our kids, to watch over them, protect them from any harm that would come to them physically or emotionally mentally or spiritually or in any other facet of their being you would protect them and we pray that they will learn things this year that will enable them to function as effective human beings but that they will remember that the most important lessons they will learn are about loving you and loving others the two greatest commands bless those who are teachers in our schools both those who teach their children in a homeschool environment, those who teach in private schools, those who teach in public schools, universities, colleges. Bless all of our teachers with wisdom and understanding and knowledge and an ability to communicate the truths that you have woven into the fabric of reality. Bless all of our members who are involved as administrators and leaders 
in their schools, that they will administrate with, with faithfulness and integrity and justice. God, again, we just lift up our kids and ask you to bless them with a great school year. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for being. Have a great day.